Good morning. Welcome to Truth for Today. This is Dai Qing Yuan, your host and teacher, pastor of Abilene Bible Church. Today we are continuing our study of Eucharist, the meaning of communion. The word Eucharist means feeling good, you, about carries, about gift. So Eucharist is being thankful for the sacrifice of Christ. So Eucharist is the formal name uh, for communion. Okay? I Eucharist is in the pair with I, be, I baptize. Baptism is the Christian rite of initiation, and the Eucharist is the Christian rite of continuation. Okay? Uh, some have um, mechanicalized, the Catholic have made it mechanical, that you are saved by your baptism, but well, that's not true. Your water baptism does not save you. Your spiritual baptism, being regenerated by the Holy Spirit, saves you. Water baptism is a testimony to the world about who you are. And uh, you are declaring your sin before have been washed clean, and now you are dead with Christ, and you are going to rise up to walk with Christ. And in walking on this earth, even though you have been bathed, you are clean, but your feet will get dirty. That's why you let Christ wash your feet again, and that is what Eucharist does. Okay? In communion, you remember the work of Christ on you and for you, and being grateful for His sacrifice, you are willing to repent of your sins, and that's how you are cleansed again. It is not the, you, the elements that does it, it's your heart. When you f uh, understand and feel the uh, uh, heart and the work and the presence of Christ, and that's what continues to cleanse you. Okay. So that's the meaning of uh, Eucharist. And uh, we have linked the uh, communion to uh, covenants and uh, testaments. Okay, covenant is a contract, and the testament is a, uh, well, it's, it's a will, but it's a document about covenant. So the Old Testament focused on the Old Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, New Testament focused on the New Covenant, or the Yeshua's Covenant, or Messianic Covenant. Okay? These two are all um, developments of two of the three promises to uh, God made to Abraham. He promised Abraham that he will give him a land, a nation, and a blessing. The land covenant a land promise was developed by the Mosaic Covenant, is the renter's contract for the land. Okay? The new covenant is about through one seed saving all nations, and that seed is Jesus, so the church, which is from all nations, entered the new covenant. Israel, the first, will become actually the last in terms of national repentance. And the, the, the nation, the promise of the nation, actually is related with the king. Israel as a nation lost its government, lost its land, but it's returned to its land and it's returned uh, and reformed and has now a government. But it does not have the son of David as its king. When that happens, the, uh, the, the national co covenant will be fulfilled, and that will happen when Jesus comes again. Okay. So, uh, in terms of covenants, we have um, four types in the Jewish culture, and, uh, and they are witnessed in the Bible, and in all of them. Uh, number one is called the blood covenant. In blood covenant, God redeems the sins of man by shedding the blood of his son. And that is high price to pay. When he paid that price, he purchased the, uh, the redeemed. So, uh, the saved people used to be servants or slaves of sin and Satan, and now they become servants or slaves of God. And uh, therefore, blood covenants relate with servanthood. It's a purchase. And, uh, and another kind is called the salt uh, covenant. It is related with friendship. Okay? We have reviewed the, um, the f um, 
five major sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. There's a sin offering, there's a guilt offering. Those are paying for uh, what man owed God and others. Okay, in the vertical and horizontal dimension. That's the preparation for repairing man's relationship to God. And the whole burnt offering is a dedication of oneself to God. And the once a person does that, it, uh, the, the servanthood to God was established. And it should be renewed daily because they have daily offering. Okay? And those are all blood offerings. But the fourth offering is called the grain offering. Okay, the grain offering is um, um, composed of cereal produce of the land. They are made of grain. Uh, they are either raw or cooked. Okay, but anyway, it is without blood. Okay, that's why it's called the most holy. <laughs> and because blood, in the, on the one hand, it is sanct uh, sanctified because it uh, represents life. It's sacred. But on the other side, it is unclean because it comes from inside the body. The Bible teaches everything from inside the body is unclean, symbolizing that the soul of a sinner is unclean. Okay, so therefore, things we eat do not make us unclean, as Jesus said, but things that come out of the body, the bad thoughts, bad words, and bad actions, that is unclean. Okay. So all of these ceremonial laws about the dirtiness of the bodily fluid or excrement or blood, they are all symbolizing the, this, the fallen nature or dirtiness of sinner's soul. Okay. And uh, uh, the blood, therefore, is dual nature. It's both sacred, representing life, and dirty from inside of the body. Okay. So cereal, the, the grain offering, is the most holy because it is the only offering without blood. Okay, that's why it's holy. And uh, if it's cooked, it must have salt and oil. Okay, if it's not cooked, you will put oil on it. If it's cooked, it must add salt. So this is the grain offering. Therefore, is related with what? With oil and salt. Okay, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. See, anointing by the Holy Spirit. So. Presenting grain offering is asking the Holy Spirit to anoint us, to sanctify us. And how about salt? Well, salt is um, uh, salt keeps things fresh, and it is also a sense of renewal. Okay, and uh, uh, salt covenant, on the other hand, means two parties mix up their salt and mix them together and then separate again. Therefore, their most precious asset at that time, because salt was mo more important, more uh, expensive than gold, in cunning weight. Uh, so their most expensive own, uh, properties are now mixed up with each other. You know? uh, mine is yours and yours is mine. And that tells us the permanency of friendship. So salt covenant is the beginning of friendship. Okay? When men are redeemed and became the servants of God, that is, not, that is where we should be, and that's where we have legally become. But God doesn't want us to stay at that pl place. He wants us to be lifted up. He condescended to come and redeem us, and He will also elevate us from a servant to a friend, like Abraham and Moses were called friends of God. And that's what we should be. Friends consider for each other. Friends consider the other's uh, interest as their own interest. They don't live for themselves, they live for their friend's life. Okay? And uh, that's what Abraham and Moses uh, were. They thought for God. They live for God. Okay? Not just for themselves. So, um, the salt covenant, therefore, uh, is related with becoming friends, and uh, it's related with the grain offerings because it must have salt and oil. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, it, it means asking God to sanctify us and make us His friends, okay? Elevated us from servant to friend. And uh, therefore, we know that friendship is to God is based on servanthood to God. If you do not recognize you are now basically a slave and servant of God because you are purchased 
from sin and Satan. Okay, that's where you should be. If you don't serve God with all you can and think about His will and do what His hand points to, if you're not a good servant, you can't be a good friend of God. Okay, starting from being becoming God's good servant, then you may become God's good friend. Okay, and uh, in doing that, He will sanctify you. He make you holy, having His nature, so you can commune with each other because you are uh, s uh, s similar in nature, and men become uh, partakers of God's nature. So, in the, uh, a sense, this saying is correct. God became a man, Jesus Christ, so that man may become God. Not in the sense of being eternally in existence or uh, all-powerful. No, it means morally we will become holy, just, and uh, loving, just like Jesus. Okay? We will become partakers of His nature, but only the moral nature, not in existence, not in the power. So, uh, that is the meaning of the grain offering and the salt covenant, and that's relating with God elevating us from His servants to His friends. But even that is not the end. God wants to uh, elevate us even higher. Now we come to the next kind of covenant. It's called the sandal covenant. Sandal uh, is a kind of shoe, okay, made of straw usually. And uh, in the old uh, uh, Israel um, or Ju Judea, people use the old sandal, uh, un uh, put it under a rock or a brick as the markers of the property boundaries. So if you have a yard uh, and you have a boundary and you have a neighbor, but how do you mark the, uh, the boundary? In the modern times, we don't want to see each other, <laughs> so we put on high <laughs> uh, fences. Well, probably don't want others to see what we're doing. <laughs> that's why I put on offenses. But in the ancient times, that's too costly. What they do, and they didn't have barbed wire yet. <laughs> so what they did is to put a sandal under a rock. Okay, and that's the mark of your boundary. Okay, of your property. Therefore, uh, uh, the sandal covenant is related with property rights. Okay. It is a crime to move the boundary markers. Actually, in Deuteronomy 19.14, it is placed with the death penalty. <laughs> the laws with death penalty. Either in contrast, saying you should not, or in agreement, saying this one could be punished by death. It says in Deuteronomy 19.14, You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark, which the ancestors have set, in your inheritance which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God uh, gives you to possess. Okay? And the context is in the laws related with the death penalty. <laughs> so, moving boundary marks could be a severe crime, whether or not it should or should not. Yeah, be applied uh, to death penalty, but uh, it is a crime to move boundary markers, and therefore sandals. Okay, and uh, so now we know sandals became the symbol of property rights, possessions, inheritance, stewardship, stewardship, and sonship. Okay, you know sons are not anymore children. Children do not have property rights. They are kind of like accessories to the household. <laughs> they, are, they even have lower position than the servants. The servants going to master over them, teach them, and, uh, and uh, educate them. But once the children grow up to be sons, they will have property rights. They will inherit the father's estate, and they will become the steward uh, of the household. Okay? And sons have inheritance, and they have possessions, they have property rights. You see, sandals are related with sonship. Okay? Now, uh, in the uh, Old Testament, Moses had to remove his worldly possessions before he received the divine possession, holiness. Remember the burning bush? Okay? Moses saw the burning bush at Mount Sinai, and God 
called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Exodus 3, 4 to 5. Okay. Why does God want Moses to take off his shoes? I wondered, you know, shoes are dirty. You know, somebody's feet are more dirty or smelly <laughs> than the shoes. So why does God want take, uh, people to take off their shoes? Okay, well, I think it is talking about taking away your inheritance from the world. Okay, shoes uh, or sandals are related with inheritance, right? Uh, Moses wasn't a rich man, but he was the, um, the son-in-law of the high priest of the Midianites, and he is the only son-in-law. <laughs> the, the, the high priest has seven daughters, and as far as we know, only one married <laughs> to him. So he will inherit a lot of things, okay? Uh, although he didn't have all the rights to his children, his children weren't circumcised because he married up. He was a slave laborer married to the master's daughter. But uh, he has worldly inheritance, and he was born a Hebrew, but he was raised up as a prince of Egypt. He has a lot of worldly possession. But God says, take off your worldly possession before you can inherit holiness from God. Okay? And I think that is probably the proper explanation of taking away the sandals. Okay, and uh, another example in the Old Testament about sandals and property is in the book of Ruth. A near relative of Ruth, uh, who could have been the kinsman redeemer of her. Uh, in ancient Israel, when a um, brother died, uh, the other brother had the duty to marry the widow of the dead brother no matter he's married or not. Okay? This actually is not a good thing <laughs> for the brother, because you add a wife to your household, you add trouble. All right? And when you have children from this wife, the children is not counted as yours. It's counted as the dead brother's, so that the dead brother's land will have people to inherit. Okay, so it is not good for this living brother. If he doesn't give children to this wife, he could have inherited the land. Okay, you see, it takes very unselfish people to do this, uh, what we call them, the kinsman redeemer role. Okay, to marry uh, the, you know, the, the close relative's wife into the, your existing family, spoil your inheritance structure, and uh, complicate your family, but that is because your love for your dead brother, and because of your respect of the property rights okay, that the ancestors set according to the guidance of God. Actually, it was throwing a lot by God, uh, by God's directions, uh, direction um, through the hands of Joshua. So, um, to become a kinsman redeemer is a selfless act, is a noble thing to do but it is um, disruptive to one's current interest. Now, Ruth mar was a Moabite. He married a Jew. Uh, his husband died, and uh, his mother-in-law was too old to give birth to another child for her to marry, so she needs other, a further relative to become the kinsman redeemer. And uh, the closest one refused to take up the role to take the role. And he, uh, at first he said, oh, I can redeem the land. But when he was told he has to marry Ruth and, uh, and have children not counted as his own, he said, no, I don't want to do it. Okay? Boaz is the next in line. Boaz loved Ruth for her good character because he took care, took care of Naomi, her uh, mother-in-law. And uh, Boaz loved the Ruth, even though they have a great age difference, but there was hard feeling. And uh, Ruth also loved Boaz, but there was a barrier. There was the other person, okay? the other relative. But when that relative refused, when we read that book, we say, whew, I'm glad <laughs> he refused. But that person did something that's ignoble. That's why he took off his sandals 
and symbolizing giving up the rights to the land of Naomi and Ruth. In Ruth 4, 7 to 8, um, the Bible says, Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and give it, uh, gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, and removed his sandal. You see, now this is another biblical event related with sandal and property right. Okay, so now we know sandal covenant is related with property right, property right, and therefore ownership and sonship. Okay. Now, we now look at all of these covenants, we see a progressive nature because the new covenants do not take away the rights uh, gained under the old covenant, it only adds on to it. Okay. One must recognize first that he is nothing but a creation, a subject, and a servant of God. But offering the blood of uh, by offering the blood offerings, accepting the ultimate blood offering by God, Jesus Christ. Okay, so we are God's subjects because, and uh, he, uh, we are uh, owned by God because He is our Creator. The owner owns the creation. Okay? We were servants of sin and Satan because of sin. And now when God purchased us by the blood of Christ, we now belong to God in the same role, servant or slave. Okay? So that is the beginning of our relationship with God, redeemed servants. Okay? We are bought from one evil master to a uh, good master. Okay? And uh, we also... Can, uh, one also can become a friend of God by endeavoring to be sanctified, more like God in moral nature, less like the world which is hostile to God. So when we are sanctified, when we put on oil, like the Holy Spirit to fill us, put on salt to be refreshed and uh, to remember we become friends of God, we cannot never be satisfied. Now his possession is ours, but ours is also his. Okay? When we do that, then we become friends of God. And friends of God have the same rights as a servant of God, but more. Okay? And the next one, one can become a son of God, given authorities to manage God's estate, the future full kingdom of God. Uh, and uh, the kingdom actually will have an end at the uh, last judgment, but the household will go on forever. You see, kingdoms are nations or governments that exist to suppress rebellion. But before there was rebellion and after there's you know, at the end of all rebellion, there will be no more kingdom but household. Okay? There was the family of God, the Trinity. It was a family. Okay? And then God created, created a household with angels and men, okay? servants and children, and before the rebellion. But um, Satan rebelled, and then the, the household became a kingdom. God had to suppress the rebellion with all kinds of authorities. And at the end, after the final judgment at the great white throne, all of the evil are separated and uh, um, what is um, left in the new heaven and new earth is a new a c infinite uh, time for the household of God. So we ha can become a son of God and we will manage God's estate in the future full kingdom okay, of God. So a son of God has all the rights of the servants of God as well as duty <laughs> and the friends of God. Okay, rights and duty. Okay, now but he has more. Okay, because the 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 greatest son of God is the eternal son, the only begotten son, and the, he was actually the best servant. He's the servant of Yahweh. So when we become followers of Christ as Christians, follower of Christ, we should be what he uh, do what he does, be a son and therefore also a friend of God and therefore also a servant of God. See, we rise up from the position of a servant to friend to son, and then we go around to do the duties of the friend, uh, of the, serv uh, the son, the friend, and the servant. Okay? That's a full cycle. Okay? He lifts us up, and we will 
uh, bent down like Christ did himself. So we humble ourselves in order to serve God. Those are the progressive nature of the covenants. And uh, um, finally, we will, uh, when we meet next time, we will talk about what Christ did at the Last Supper. At that time, he combined the three kind of covenants, the sandal, the salt, and the, the, uh, the blood covenant. And uh, at the end, he made it into a marriage covenant with his church. So we will look at the, the Last Supper, and we'll look at the regular four cups uh, at the Passover dinner and the betrothal party. And that will link all of the symbolisms together. And for now, let's remember uh, all of the covenants are progressive. And uh, when we get the later stage, we don't lose the rights of the former ones. And uh, we were made servants of God by accepting the blood covenant. That's Jesus sacrificing himself. And we are made into friends of God by offering the grain uh, offering. That means we are, uh, we want uh, the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. And finally, we will become sons of God and we will enter the Sandal Covenant because we will be managers of God's estate for eternity to come. Amen. God is great and God is good. Truth For Today TV Ministry is one of the oldest TV programs in West Texas, having over half a century of history. It had been supported by both the viewers and Abilene Bible Church. 2013 to 2014 is a year when the viewers totally supported the cost of airing, while Abilene Bible Church continued to support the cost of staffing and producing. It worked out greatly, and God has provided all our needs for the last year. There are many teachers and preachers but not everyone is accurately interpreting the Bible. We believe that we have done our homework in studying the Bible and finding its correct meaning and significance by interpreting literally and contextually, reading out what the Word said to us rather than reading into it what we want it to say. God's Word is the source and nutrition of spiritual life. We in Truth For Today know how essential it is to be constantly fed by the Word. We work diligently to supply that to you. Who, for various reasons, cannot join a church service at this time. We pray that God will bless you in your needs and lead you to live a fruitful life in both the physical and the spiritual realm. If you have been blessed by this program, please continue to pray for us that we will remain faithful in our ministry and God will supply all our needs. If you feel God's leading to support the ministry financially, do not quench the Spirit. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit so that you will lead a spiritual life and our program can continue to be a blessing to more people. Amen.